So if you'll turn in scripture to the book of Acts, that's where we're going for our sermon text today. The book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 24 to 28. If you want to follow along in your pew Bibles, there's the page number on the screen, page 1,579. Okay. Acts 17, 24 to 28. This is what God's word says. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. So last week, we started this four-part sermon series um, entitled, A Balanced Diet. And last week, we talked about the importance of balance. And the two principles we explored were, were, how do we seek God and God's opinion as opposed to the opinion of man or the opinion of the world? And the second principle we talked about was, how do we say no so we can say a better yes? All right, today we want to continue on in our balanced diet journey, and we want to talk about the upward journey, the upward journey. I don't know about you, but I am a people watcher. I love to watch people. The mall is one of my favorite places to go to watch people. You can sit at a mall and you can see all kinds of things. You can see parents with children. You can see older folks just walking around the mall getting exercise. You can see teenagers and their interplay. It's always interesting. I've been a people watcher for a while. I actually enjoy gazing at some people, especially my family. You see, ever since Sharon and I got married, I've enjoyed gazing at her. Now, if she's awake and I'm gazing at her, And then she assumes that I want something, need something, have something profound to say. And it gets a little awkward, so I find it best to gaze at her while she's sleeping. And ever since we got married, it's just so precious to watch her sleep. Now, for instance, last Sunday, we were watching the football game. And um, all four of us were in the living room. Sharon was on my left. Toby was on my right. Noah was on the love seat. Noah was busy watching some YouTube videos about a game he likes to play, and Sharon and Toby were asleep, and I was watching the game, but I kept getting distracted by watching her. Sometimes I've even been so bold as to take a picture of her sleeping. You want to see one? There she is. It was dark in the room, you know. Don't tell her I have this, by the way. We don't want to know that. You know, not only do I enjoy gazing at Sharon while she's sleeping, but what about the kids? Have you ever watched a baby sleep? It just, it's like your blood pressure lowers just watching them sleep. Now, if you're a parent and it's your child, your blood pressure lowers because they're not crying, right? They're not demanding 12 things. And it's just, it's just precious just to watch them sleep and just to gaze upon them. What a joy. They are cute. Today we want to talk about the fact that God gazes upon us with the same warmth 
that you just had as you gazed upon this little one sleeping. So we want to talk about the upward journey. The upward journey or our walk with God. As you know, we're headed um, three different directions. We're going to talk about the upward journey, our walk with God, the inward journey, how we do more, better self-awareness, and then the outward journey, how we walk with others. Today, the upward journey. So and when we talk about the upward journey, we're talking about someone who loves us, someone who likes to watch us and gaze on us. We want to talk about our walk with God and how we experience that walk. Our walk with God is what we're talking about when we refer to the upward journey. So the upward journey is first a journey of entering God's presence. It's not a journey of thinking about God. It's not a journey of service. It's a journey of being in, of entering into God's presence. You see, it's in God's presence that there we can experience transformation. Some of us are under the impression that we have to become transformed so that we can stand in God's presence. Nothing could be further from the truth. God's presence is where we experience transformation. It's in his holy presence that we then see who we are and we find ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit being transformed. Now this journey begins when we acknowledge that we are a sinner. When we are willing to say, I have a sin problem. I stand in need of God's grace. Lord, I have no way to fix this sin problem in me. Many of us came to that realization a very long time ago. And that's when our upward journey began. That moment in time, John Wesley would say that moment of justif justifying grace Wesley divided grace into three categories. He said there's this experience we all have before we come to that realization where God is working in our life. He called that prevenient grace, the grace that goes before, where God is working on us and we begin to see things and say, well, I, w I wonder about God. I, I wonder what God wants of me is, is, is interested. Why is he interested in me? And, and, and how does this all work? For some of us, we were very small children when we had provenient grace working on our life. For some of us, it happened in adulthood. But that moment in which we experience justification, where we say, God, help. Without you, I'm lost. At that moment, our upward journey begins. And it carries on until the day we stand before him. That grace that we experience in that moment has nothing to do with what you and I have or can bring to the table. That grace is unmerited love of God purchased for us by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The word grace makes a great acrostic. G for grace is gifts are received A at C Christ's e expense gifts received at Christ's expense grace is not something we can earn okay parents we get this more than anybody else when your child was born what did they do to get you to love them they didn't have to do anything did they they were born and you loved them. Moms, you had a head start on the dads. You knew them for about nine months longer than the dads. I get that. You're already madly in love with them. The dads are just getting to meet them. But the children do nothing. In fact, for the first couple of years, all they do is make demands. Amen? And we still love them, don't we? We would, at that moment, put ourselves in harm's way for that child. If they needed something to sustain life and we were the only ones who could give it and it would cost us our lives, we would probably give it. That's the love of God. Do you hear me? 
That's how much God loves you, and that's how God loves you. If we, sinners, can do that for our children, why are you surprised that the creator of the universe who is perfect, and according to 1 John, is love, why are you surprised that he feels that way about you? Due to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his grace has come into your life, and your upward journey began. So a question, is this journey, is this walk with God that you have, is it transactional or is it relational? Transactional or relational? Let me define a transactional walk for you and maybe that'll help. In a transactional walk, first, I realize that I need to be transformed in order to be loved. Secondly, I do things to gain God's love. And thirdly, God owes me blessings because of all my good works. That's a transactional walk with God. You know, I do something, God does something. I serve him, he owes me. Uh, if, If I'm not experiencing blessing, well, that's probably because I've been bad. I probably screwed up. I swore at somebody, I did something inappropriate, I had an impure thought, therefore, that's why my tire went flat. That's why I got fired. That's why I'm sick. It's all transaction. It's no different than going into the grocery store and saying, I have money, you have food, let's make a deal. In a transactional relationship with God, it's all about let's make a deal. Now, I see a lot of people saying, no, 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 that's not what I have. But be honest. Is that not how our brains often work? Somehow we think, I need to be good so God will love me. I need to be good so God will bless me. I I have to be good to, to make sure that I'm saved. No, you don't. Should you be obedient? Yes. Because sin hurts you and hurts the community. Either you're saved by grace or you're not. And that's where it stops, folks. God loves you, period. He may not like your behavior, but he loves you. Now, some of us had parents and we had transactional relationships with our parents, amen? It was all about performance. They loved us more when we were good, when we helped out. In my home growing up, some of you know my my dad had a grocery store. And so we were expected after school to help out in the store. Store didn't close till six. And if mom came in and we were all sitting around the television and she's out trying to help dad in the store and trying to get dinner ready, usually that resulted in a wooden spoon and some fast feet. You get me? There was an expectation. It it, it gave many of us the impression that that there was a transactional relationship there in our family. I think in their heart, my parents loved us. No question about it. But it seemed transactional. And in some cases, you had a family where it was absolutely transactional. If you didn't clean the house or do whatever, There was severe punishment. Most people would say that was called abuse. And so for you, transactional relationships is really where you live. It's reinforced by work, right? Your paycheck only happens when you actually go to work. Unless you have a job like mine and you're on salary, then, you know, you show up on Sunday when you feel like it. I've been trying for 29 years to convince churches that I shouldn't have to work weekends, and I cannot get a church to buy it. I don't know anybody else that works all weekends. Like, what's up with that? Okay, so if you don't have a transactional relationship with God, or if you do and you say, I'm getting the impression this isn't what I should have, okay, then what should you be having? Well, you should be having a relational walk with God. Let me define that. One, You need to get a hold of this. I am loved. 
You need to say that to yourself multiple times every day. You may not have evidence of this from your parents. You may not have evidence of this from your spouse. Your children may not truly love you like you should be loved or respected as a parent. But you need to get that God is perfect. God is love and God loves you. You say, but you don't know what I've done. Well, let's go to the New Testament. A woman caught in adultery. Did Jesus love her? Absolutely. God loves us. He does. Not because of what we can do for him, not because of what we've done in the past, not because we have enough money or enough good looks or enough potential. He loves us. The way you love that baby when it's born, not knowing whether they're going to be good at school or bad, not knowing whether they're ever going to move out of your basement, you just love them. And that's how God feels about you. Secondly, God's love leads to transformation, not the other way around. Oh, I should have backed up. Hold on, let's back up just a second. Let me give you some text here. It's important that you hear Scripture and Scripture's um, perspective on this stuff. John 3.16 says this. You know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you remember what the next verse says? God sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. He loves you, hands down. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't say, I tell you what, When you get your act together, I'll send my son to die for you. I tell you, when you can muster enough good deeds, when you can say enough right things, when you can give enough money to the church, when you can serve enough hours, then I will love you. Then I will send my son to die for you. That's not what he said, did he? He said, while we were busy calling him names, not believing in him, Treating him like garbage. He sent his son to die for us. Let that soak in a minute. That's how loved you are. So secondly, God's love leads to transformation. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It does not say we're being transformed because we're coming to church every Sunday, because we're in a small group, because we're serving on a committee, because we're being nice to people in our community. That's the outcome of transformation. The transformation happens by grace, and it happens when we stand in relationship to our Heavenly Father. In my life, in 1994, as many of you know, I went through a divorce. In 1997, I met a young lady by the name of Sharon. I'd been a single dad for a couple of years, and and I was a better dad single than I was married to my first wife because I was more balanced. But when Sharon came into my life, I became a much better father. I was better able to care for the boys. I was better able to care for the church. She helped me to become a better dad. She's a sinner. You get that, right? I mean, I may talk about her like she's a saint, but she's a sinner like you and I. Think about being in a relationship with the perfect God of the universe. That's going to have a transformational implication, isn't it? That's going to begin to change who we are. He puts his Holy Spirit within us, gives us, Scripture says, the mind of Christ. 
all of a sudden, we are going to start looking and acting differently. I wish it was instantaneous, don't you? Because Paul still says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? There's still work to be done, to be sure. But the transformation begins and ends with the Holy Spirit working within us. Our part, the fear and trembling part, is surrendering. It's letting go of those things that are not godly in our lives. But the transformation comes from God. The third thing about a relational walk with God is that my good works are not a demand, but a response to God's love. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And then one of my favorite passages of Scripture, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Your good works are a result of your transformation. They're not to cause your transformation. Your good works do not secure your salvation. Your salvation was secured on the cross of Christ. When he rose from the dead, that's it. You were secure. In a relational walk, we realize it's about our time with God. It's not about what we can do or what we can offer. You see, our Heavenly Father is our Abba. In Galatians 4, 6, and 7, it says, Because you are his sons and daughters, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who cries out, Abba, Father, you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. This word, Abba, it is, is a word that, if you think about that, that term you had for your dad that was all about affection, it's the notion of, of the dad that walks in the door from, from the field, from the barn, from work, and the children come running with their arms up, Daddy! And they just want to play. That's the term Abba. That's the God of the universes asking of us. Will you, will you call me Abba? Will you call me Daddy? Will, will you run into my arms and spend time with me? I encourage parents always to wrestle with their children. I know some people say, well, that's kind of violent. No, it's wonderful. It's what kids need. They need to see their parent down on the floor wrestling with them and tickling them and having fun with them and reminding them that they just bring total joy to their life. That's how God thinks of us. When we are in his presence, he is just all smiles. He loves us. He can't wait for us to spend time with him. Let me go back to an illustration from my own experience. When Sharon and I started dating, our first date was at the end of July of 1997. Um, I, I took her to an Applebee's restaurant to hear the story of her experience in Poland. I told people that later I decided if it went well, it was a date. If it went poorly, it was a pastoral visit. I won both ways. <laughs> her parents were part of my congregation. She only showed up on occasion when she was home from, from work or from Europe. Um, she hadn't grown up in that congregation. They started attending after she left for college. So we had this first experience together, and she was just an amazing lady to me. So I thought, boy, she told me, I got this job in Pittsburgh. Mind you, we're eating in Jamestown, New York, because I'm serving in Lander, Pennsylvania, which is right at the New York state line. I thought, well, she got a job in Pittsburgh. You know, school doesn't start till the end of August. I got a whole month to figure out whether I like this girl or not. I said, oh, when do you move? And she said, in two days. <laughs> Thus began our long distance relationship. Now, uh, we did not have cell phones at the time. My phone bill very quickly got to be $300 a month. That's not good. 
We wrote letters back and forth. Between the phone calls and the letters, I got to know her. But you know what? Nothing was the same as being in her presence. Amen? I would drive 160 miles to spend an hour or two with her. To turn around and drive 160 miles back home. On a Saturday night, knowing I needed to preach on Sunday morning, I didn't care. I got a little bit of time in her presence. I got to take her out to dinner. I got to, I got to talk to her for a little while, face to face. Have you ever thought about God that way? Or is all of your experience of God reading his letters or talking to him on the phone? Have you ever thought about just spending time in his presence? Just soaking up that connection? See, the reality is, is the one we seek is seeking us. I love this quote from a book called The Sacred Romance by Curtis and Eldridge. They say this, our lives are not a random series of events. They tell a story that has meaning. There rarely is something wonderful that draws our heart. We are being wooed. Is anyone in charge? Someone strong and kind who notices us? At some point, we have all answered that question, no, and gone on to live in a smaller story. But the answer is yes. There is someone strong and kind who notices us. They go on in the book and they say this in another place. They talk about a totem pole of intimacy between us and our Heavenly Father. They say, we are clay and he is the potter. Moving up a notch, we are sheep and he the shepherd. Moving upward, we are the servant of the master. God also calls us his children and himself, our heavenly father, which brings us into the possibility of real intimacy. Friendship opens a level of communion that a five-year-old doesn't know with his mother and father, but there is still a deeper and higher level of intimacy and partnership awaiting us at the top of this metaphorical ascent. We are lovers. Think about that. God calls us the bride and he the bridegroom. Do, do you realize you're in a love affair with the heavenly father? Think about that a minute. He wants to be connected with us at that level. He is seeking his bride. He is chasing her. If you have any doubt about that, read the little minor prophet Hosea. Hosea the prophet is chasing his wife Gomer. And what's she doing? She's working as a prostitute. She keeps leaving him and sleeping with other people. And he keeps chasing her and chasing her and chasing her. It's not just the story of Hosea. It's a metaphor of how God is chasing us every day, even, even when we are unfaithful, even when we prostitute ourselves to other gods, the God of work, the God of leisure, the God of money, the God of power. God is still seeking us. The one you seek is seeking you. In the New Testament, we see his seeking in things like the stories of John 15. Do you remember those? The shepherd seeking the one lost sheep and leaving the 99 alone to go find the one. The woman who lights a lamp and sweeps a whole house looking for what? One coin. The father who sits on the porch and waits and waits and waits for the sun and finally he sees him way down the road turn the corner and he runs he doesn't wait and say here he comes spent all the money coming back with his tail between his legs no he runs 
after that child. One commentator says that father probably hasn't run in 25 years or more. It was undignified for grown men in that day to run. Undignified, they just didn't do it. That father ran. That's God chasing you, seeking you, longing to be in relationship with you. I want you to take a moment. I want you to close your eyes. I don't want you to think about God. I want you to take a moment and experience God. I want you to say a simple prayer as we close our eyes and imagine maybe either this scene on the screen or another scene of of calm and peace and invite God to let you catch him gazing at you. God, we want to encounter you. We don't want to think about you. We don't want to read about you in scripture, although it's wonderful. We want to see you. We want to sense your presence. We want to gaze on your face. We pray, Father, that as we breathe out the stress and worry of this day, that we could breathe in your peace, your calm, your presence, your rest. We pray, God, that we would be able to see you gazing at us like a parent gazes upon their child in a crib. We want to see your smile. We want to hear your warm, inviting voice. We want to see you and experience you in this moment. Father, thank you that shame is never from you. Thank you that from you comes love and love only. We're embarrassed that our lives are not clean, but we are grateful that you love us in spite of the dirt in our lives. Lord, may this image of your face draw us Invite us, transform us, for you are indeed for us, Father. You celebrate us, you seek us, you chase after us. You are our Abba, our Daddy. Thank you, Father, for a moment to experience you. In Jesus' name, amen.